Mitch Marner, like, where are you at? Because, man, like, on Thursday, it's going to be two weeks since he last skated, right? Yeah, well, the longer this goes, the more you start to get a little bit more concerned about it. And I was on the broadcast on Thursday. We were doing the game on TSN where Dregs actually revealed what it is he was dealing with. And the minute he said high ankle sprain, mild, serious, light, I mean, this isn't a fun thing to come back from. So... And especially when you're talking about Mitch Marner, when you watch him play, like a lot of his brilliance comes from the way he skates on his edges, right? I mean, the way he opens up those hips, the way he controls the puck. So I think the the luxury that the Maple Leafs have afforded themselves right now is that they can sit him out games without having to have too much of a worry about the impact of wins and losses, right? And so... You know, the good side of it is in three games he's been out, they've scored 13 goals. So they haven't really missed much of that offense. And look, I mean, everybody who watches the Maple Leafs knows how impactful Mitch Marner is to this this team. I think he's the most important player on this team because of all of the areas of games that he affects, you know, defensively, offensively with the power play, the way he controls the puck through the neutral zone five on six, six on five. Like he's always the guy on the ice. And so they, and you can see with the record that they have with him in the lineup, you know, uh, over his career without him in the lineup versus other guys in the team, clearly he's the guy that is the most impactful. So talking about his injury right now, the fact that he's not skating doesn't make me believe that he's anywhere close to returning. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, let's pump the brakes here. It's concerning because of what he's dealing with. But the timing of this is probably, um, you know, best suited for where they are right now. Better to deal with this now than closer to the playoffs. Yeah, I don't think you mess around with those things, especially with a player like him and and this close to the playoffs. So, you know, people are kind of mashing the panic button. But what else do you want them to say if it is what they say it is? There's like there's no conspiracy. What do you want them to say? It's just it's not responding well. It's going to be a little bit longer. Hopefully, like if it continues to get a little bit better, then we can start saying it's day to day, like not the end of the world. But speaking of uh, lineup issues, you know, Simon Benoit is going to get back in the lineup here. And we've been talking a lot about you know, left-handed defenseman, right-handed defenseman. We wanted to ask you, you know, how big of a deal is it for a guy to be playing on his offhand? Um, What are some of the challenges and maybe benefits? And how do you think they're maneuvering that with, you know, such limited righties? Well, they're they're maneuvering it in their best way that they can based on their options, right? I mean, you saw them try to go out and get, they got Labushkin, they tried to address bringing another right-hand defense. And the problem is, you know, we talked to Mark Mathot this morning who watches Ottawa play. They don't have any right-handed shot defensemen too. Like it's 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 sort of uh, something that across the league everybody would want more of. And I think, look back when when we played, when the game was slower, I don't think it was that big of an issue. You know, you just put the guys out there that can get the job done. You saw more guys play it with more efficiency. Nowadays, with the speed of the game, and I know even the, the tail end of my career, where. I always volunteered to play the right side because if it allowed me to stay in the lineup, I was willing to make that sacrifice. But I always felt more comfortable on my strong side because of the pace of the game, right? Everything's in front of you. You, you can't hold up for guys anymore. So, you know, when you're when you're trying to make a, a backhanded play into the middle of the ice, your vision's not that great. Trying to gap up on guys where you're maybe stronger pivoting on one side versus the other side. It, it's a big challenge, right? It's, 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 I think there is validity to it with the way people are talking about it because you see, I mean, TJ Brody's a great example. He's a guy through the early part of his career could do it as he's getting older, maybe a little bit slower. He's struggling with it. Look how good he played on the left side. It's almost seemed like the game is simpler for those guys. So in a perfect world, yeah, you want three left-handed and three right-handed shot defensemen. They don't have a perfect scenario for them. So they just got to go, with you know whatever they have and try to make the best of it now i never believed that benoit should have been the guy coming out of the lineup with the acquisitions of labushkin and edmondson i mean this guy is the best story on the maple leafs this year Uh you know when you talk about what he came in for you know on contract um talk about you know the fact that nobody really knew much about him because he played in anaheim and a guy who's had to earn his role on this team 
I thought he's done a tremendous job doing it, especially with the way that he plays. He brings that physical element, likes to mix it up. You know, I always love watching those guys that, you know, make life hard on defensemen or make a light hard on forwards in front of the net. He's one of those guys. I actually thought, you know, maybe it was a good time to give Brody a break or use Lilligren as a guy. Because, look, people can say what they want about Lilligren. I've never really been on the Lilligren bus. I've always seen the potential, but how much, how, like, there's only so much that potential can get you, right? I mean, this is a guy that's been given every opportunity to be a top pairing defenseman, a top four defenseman. And every time he they give him that role, he doesn't team doesn't seem to grasp it. And then, you know, the last two seasons, he's a guy that plays all season and they can't play in the playoffs. Well, why there's a reason why they can't play in the playoffs, because I just don't think you get his best hockey when the the, the game gets tougher. And I don't, that's not changing my mind this year. And look, I know he's getting another great opportunity now running the first line PP. Yes, he brings offense, but is this a guy you can really trust in a series versus Boston and versus Florida to give you the type of play that you need from their defenseman? Absolutely not. Right. Um, I couldn't agree more. Like, I think you get to the postseason, it's a different game. And I just don't think he factors in hell. I and think Nick, can... we get reminded of that every year. Every year we get reminded of this postseason is a completely different season than the regular season. Yeah, and then he keeps coming back with him, right? I, I was yeah. going to ask you too about Keith. Like, what's your been your, your general assessment? Because often we talk about credibility mm -hmm. on this show, and we talk about um, teaching moments and all that stuff, and going back to the well and holding players accountable. But to me, he just picks his spots. Like, I, I mean, Brody's made so many mistakes, and then like yeah. the first move he makes is taking Benoit. Out. It just I think you lose credibility in that room, does he? Well, I wonder how much of that is a coach's decision versus you know a management team decision sure. right um because he's a guy that's let's be honest through his whole career and even through the early part of career here has played that role right and i always hated that when i was a defenseman it's like okay i played a role that i wasn't happy with but i played it because i knew what i needed to do or why i needed to do it to stay on the team but it's not something that i want to do Make an example of somebody else. But that's sort of how hockey is run, man. Once you get that label on you or once you, you're you put into that conversation, coaches or management don't want to entertain those, those new situations with somebody new, right? I mean, because they have guys that have been there and have done it and have been able to accept it and understand their role. You take that – not now. You start – exploring that role with a TJ Brody, who's never really been that guy. How are you setting yourself up for playoffs? So I kind of understand it. And look, I, I know there's people that have their own feelings about Sheldon Keefe. I don't feel the same way that most people do. I actually think Sheldon Keefe is a really good coach. And I think his record proves, uh, you know, it, it speaks for itself. You know, look at, Look at all like, – and the thing about the Maple Leafs is that I know there's a lot of frustration in the fan base because of their playoff success. But with all the changes this team makes on a year-to-year -year basis because of the formula that they've created with their star players and how they want to build around them, look at all the success they've had as a team. And I know it's been a lot of regular season success, but it's still success. Measure that against – a lot of the other teams in the National Hockey League who have not been a top five team consistently on a year to year basis have not had the same play uh, lineup adjustments or lineup changes that the Maple Leafs have. I think a lot of that credit goes to the coach. And, and another good example is, you know, you got Kyle Dubas who orchestrated this team with Sheldon Keefe at the helm. Kyle Dubas goes to Pittsburgh with some star studded players, a really good coach. Can't replicate that same success. So I think, look, not everyone's going to be happy with the decisions the coaches make on a daily basis, but we don't know what goes on behind the scenes that factors into those decisions. But if you look at the results and the process along the way, I mean, Bertuzzi's having a better year now. Domi's having a better year now. McMahon has come to surface. I think Matthew Nye's his best hockey is in front of him. I think Sheldon Keefe has done a really, really good job. I think he's a really good coach. And what I do like about him, and you talk about accountability, I don't necessarily see accountability with 
guys that are in in the lineup. And yes, a lot of people measure that. I I measure accountability based on decisions made within games. And that's what I like about him. Guys that are going, he gives them better opportunity. Guys that aren't going, he's like, okay, you're not going tonight, so I'm not going to play you. Yeah, fair enough. What about moving to the crease here? It looks like Ilya Samsonov is kind of doing the routine here at uh, optional pregame skate of a starter. Um, is it his crease right now? And do you think Wool's given kind of a good enough opportunity to get his feet under him after his injury this year? I think it's absolutely his crease. And because he's playing like he deserves the crease. And I don't, I don't focus too much on the goalie situation here in Toronto. I trust both guys. If you ask me at the yeah. beginning of the season, I said that at the end of the season, Wall is going to be the guy. He's going to be the guy going to the playoffs. I actually said, I actually believe Joseph Wall one day will be a Vesna candidate. Like that's how strong I feel about Wall. But unfortunately, he had an injury this year that set him back. And what I get encouraged about when I talk about Samsonov is, man. How much credit do we have to give this guy for finding his game in the middle of the season? Like this guy was a complete write off, <laughs> like in the month of December, you couldn't throw him at me. Uh, any of us could have done a better job in that. And we don't even play the position. Okay. And so whatever they did in their reset and whatever he's done to change his routine and find his form again, man, this guy deserves a, a huge round of applause because He's playing at an unbelievable level right now. And, and when you look at goaltending, like I think the goaltending position is changing across the NHL. Okay. Cause gone are the days and even Vasilevsky too. Like he, you can't play guys 65, 70 games anymore and expect them to be at the top of their game. Every one of those games, I actually believe goalies work harder in practice than they do in games. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen a practice, Rosie, you've been involved in practice. The stuff they do before practice, the stuff they do during practice, stuff they do after practice, like that doesn't even measure the type of workload these guys get in games. And now you're 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 factoring games played and stuff like that. So I still believe that Joseph Wall will give will be given a runway here down the stretch because you don't want to burn Samsonoff out. But as long as Samsonoff is playing the way that he is, he's earning those those starts, he's earning the position in net, you go with him. You absolutely go with him. And, and let's not forget, this guy helped the Maple Leafs win a playoff series last year. Like, yep. you know, that's something in 19 years no other goalie could do. Make sure to check out more of our content right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page. we got long-form interviews. we got clips. we got epic rants by Jay Rozo. We simply have it all. And don't forget, you can find out much more at theleafsnation.com. Thanks so much for watching.